Sinai. The year is 2000. I'd just been accepted into MIT to study computer science and electrical engineering. But one day, I was walking with a friend of mine. It's probably somewhere here in the audience, Söder Behid. And he'd just taken this course in New York, and he started talking about this thing, and investing, and finance, and this guy called Warren Buffett. And he's moving his hands around. And, and it sounded really interesting, really piqued my interest. So when I went back to Boston, I went to a bookstore. And I picked a few books off the shelf that I thought were uh, on investing in stocks. And I started reading. And very quickly, very quickly, something clicked. I'd found my passion. But I was sponsored by Saudi Aramco to study engineering. <laughs> so I went on taking the computer science and electrical engineering courses and taking finance courses for fun on the side. And pretty soon, I discovered just how absolutely ridiculous it was not to follow my passion. So despite very strong objections from my parents, I switched majors. And I think someone earlier was referring to Idara as Haggit al fashnin Yeah. So it was like, you went to MIT, you want to switch to finance? Seriously? So I did that. And I went back to Aramco. Again, they sponsored me. And within the first three months, I quit three times. <laughs> they finally accepted my resignation the third time and let me go with a big bill that I'm still paying. And I decided to focus on investing. So I went out. I started my fund, started doing what I was doing, started to grow it. It really got big, at least for me at the time. And then investment and business opportunities came my way right and left, and I jumped on every single one of them. And I was involved in a million things, and it was exciting times. And we, I co-founded a restaurant company, and we grew it by 12 times in three years. And things were exciting. And seven years into my career, I was just absolutely exhausted. I felt so overwhelmed. And I felt that my career has stopped. And it was very depressing for me. So I started to look for answers. Here's what I found. In almost every field, the exceptionally successful, the 0.1% at the top, the superstars, do phenomenally better than everybody else, orders of magnitude than everybody else. Everybody do orders of magnitude than people just below them in terms of skill. And it's not only financially. The top researchers get by far a disproportionate amount of citation, for example. This phenomenon was first written about by Sherman Rosen in 1981, and he dubbed it the superstar effect. And this superstar effect not only continues today, but actually expands because of globalization and technology. But to be a superstar, it is not enough to be excellent. You have to be the best at what you do. In his biography, comedian Steve Martin says, be so good that they cannot ignore you. And in order to achieve that, he says, focus on being exceptional, being absolutely better than everybody before you and everybody around you. But in pop culture, we're being told it's really good to be multi-talented, to be well-rounded. And that's very good, actually, as you're growing up. It's probably even good early in your career. But it's an absolute disaster as your career progresses. Successful people, I've found, are not great at everything. They're not even good at everything. But they're great at one thing, which is hard. Ambitious people have a lot of difficulty narrowing down their ambitions to a needle-thin point. 
They want to do this and that, and they're interesting in a thousand things that can be thrown out, just like what happened to me. Steve Jobs says, people think that focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on. But that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the 100 other good ideas there are. You have to pick very carefully. In fact, it's very easy to say no to bad ideas. It's only very hard to say no to good ideas. But you must focus on the absolute top ideas. The one or two or three where your talents will produce the best outcome. Stephen Covey in habit number three says, all it takes is realizing that it's all right to say no sometimes when necessary and then to focus on your highest priorities. Let me tell you a story. Mike Flint was Warren Buffett's pilot for 10 years. He's actually a pilot for several other US presidents. And he says, one day I was discussing my career with Warren and he turns to me and says, Mike, write down the 25 things you want to do now until the end of your career. Your top, your 25 goals, the most important things you must achieve. So he goes on and does that and then he tells him, now go and circle the top five ones. And Flint says, I did that. And then he turned to me and he said, so what are you going to do about the bottom 20? And Flint says, I said, well, I'm going to focus on the top five and I'm going to try to work on the other 20 in my spare time over time to achieve them. And Buffett says, no, 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 no. You've got this absolutely wrong. What you have just created is your avoid at all costs list. You must pay no attention whatsoever to those 20 until you've achieved those top five. When Steve Jobs took over Apple in 1998, it was a disaster. They had 350 different products. And one of the first things that Jobs did was narrow that down to 10. And you all know the rest of the story. Larry Page, Google's co-founder, says, focus on one important goal and be single-minded about it. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates were asked what they, the most important factor in their success was, and they both answered the same, focus. Einstein and the musician Quincy Jones were so focused on their top priorities, they never learned how to drive. Other extreme examples, many people narrow down their wardrobes. Jobs famously wears jeans and a black turn like almost every day of his life. Same can be said about Oracle's Larry Ellison. Uh, Amazon's Jeff Bezos wears khakis and a blue shirt every day. And President Obama says, ah, you'd find me most of the time wearing either a gray or a blue suit because I need to narrow down the number of decisions I have to make every day of my life. So that's where I was. That's what I've discovered. I need to focus. And after a lot of soul searching, I decided to focus on my outcome and my out capital. <laughs> And I quit every single thing unrelated to them. And that made a lot of people very upset, including my parents. Because some of those other things were profitable. But I just followed my gut and did that anyway. Since then, that was five years ago, assets under management at Mayab went from $2 million to $40 million in assets under management and $200 million in assets under advisor. We have won numerous awards, and for the past five years, we've been ranked among the top 20% of our peers globally in terms of performance. <laughs> One more thing. Learning to focus is a process. Things will creep up on you, and that's what I've learned. You have to continuously trim down your commitments. Make it a habit. At the very least, every year, sit with yourself and trim one, two, three things that you committed to. Doesn't mean they're not important, but they'll never, you'll never be able to achieve your, the top priorities if you don't continuously trim. Remember, focus is about saying no to good ideas 
and saying yes to the very top ones. Thank you.